The Remembering Them podcast is a platform for people to share stories and memories of their loved ones who have passed away. The podcast was created in memory of Dad, Bob Cecil. May he rest in peace. Your hosts, Mark Cecil and Ryan Thwaites, acknowledge the rich history and importance of storytelling within Indigenous culture. My name is Jorge Skeen, and I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we meet here today. Today we're meeting in Mianjin, and those traditional owners are the Yagara and Turrbal people. And I'd also like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and acknowledge my people, the Gabi Gabi people, and extend that acknowledgement to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people listening in today. Hello, Ryan. Welcome back to the podcast. Welcome back, man. How are you today? Very good. How are you? Yeah, fresh, refreshed, all good. good. I'm glad you're refreshed and well slept because uh, you'll need it for these three clues this morning. Oh, man. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Let's go. Clue number one. This city is home to the world's spookiest museum. This museum features 30 spine chi- spine chilling rooms and endless corridors. You will find yourself becoming the main character in a horror film. Guests even need to sign a mandatory waiver because of the dark activity that goes on inside. What? This is cool. Uh, hmm. Melbourne. <laughs> no. Okay. Second clue for you. This city has has had over 100 movies that have been shot here. One of them, I'll give you just one out of 100, and you can guess the other 99, uh, Jason Bourne. Oh, wow. Okay. 100. Uh, Austin, Texas. No. Third and final clue. This, uh, I'm not sure if this will give it away to you, but remarkably, an average of 60,000 pounds of Prawn or shrimp is devoured daily within this city's borders. God, man. Again, really coming with the clues today. These are good, but like useless. Uh, I had to because I, I feel like there was some very, very, very easy clues that I feel like you would have just got it straight up. Yeah, okay. Well, that just gave me a clue. Thanks. Um <laughs> Not a very good one, though. God, I still don't know. Let's go Sydney. No. Okay. Are hey, we in Australia? In, we are not in Australia. Okay. I'm, I'm happy well that uh, you haven't even picked the country, but we're back in the States, specifically Las Vegas, Nevada. Oh, the shrimp thing? Oh, okay. Yeah, lots of museum? seafood buffets, I'm guessing. Uh, yeah. The name of the museum is Zach Baggins's The Haunted Museum. Huh. Okay. And the movies, I only gave you one because there were the Oceans 11, yeah, 13, yeah. whatever series, uh, the Hangover the Hangover movies. Yeah, were, were given away for sure. It would have given away. So, yeah, yeah Jason yeah. Bourne was the only one out of that list that, uh, or not the only one out of 100. I didn't know about the other 195 or whatever. But, uh, yeah, those were the main You get an A today yeah. for the questions. That was, hold well on. Thank you. Thank you. So our guest is from Las Vegas, Nevada. She is an entrepreneur at heart. Uh, She has two brick and mortar businesses, a preschool and a wellness center, and multiple online businesses. Uh, She currently has the Conversation Academy where she helps people commute communicate effectively in every conversation we might need some advice after this uh, she created the conversation station a tool for educators and families to help children regulate and communicate their feelings in everyday conversations she's a mother to a 12 year old son and has been married for 26 years to the love of her life our guest today is heather chriswell So welcome to the Remembering Them podcast officially, Heather. Thank you for joining us all the way from Las Vegas in Nevada. You were just telling us uh, a few tidbits about license plates and um, scheduling that uh, has has brought you in front of us here today, which has been quite serendipitous, I'd say. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I am so grateful to be here. And, you know, to your point about scheduling, it's so interesting. Sometimes I get so upset about how a schedule falls apart or something changes or, and it in somehow, some way, it always ends up to be really divine 
fine. And I don't know how that happens. And I like to call it, you know, the magic of life, the synchronicity of life. Um, but I am surprised daily. And that is what I love about life, just being surprised. Because when the people that we love the most leave this planet physically, there, there has to be something that keeps me going because I miss them so deeply. And on the same token, it's so fun to watch them show up in different ways for me. So we were talking just before, before we hit record that uh, we've had a couple of scheduling not mishaps, but we had a, an invite that went to a spam folder and then Ryan got sick. So um, tell us again what uh, has brought us to this day, that, that special moment, and also then if that could dovetail into uh, who we're talking about today, your loved one. Yes. So um, so today uh, I have a very dear friend. We grew up together from babies. Our parents used to race Corvettes together. Her parents uh are my godparents. And so we considered ourselves god sisters. And this was back in the day where, you know, we picked a scab off of us and rubbed blood to make sure that we were god sisters. Um, so it we are connected heart to heart. And her son is my godson. And he is, his wife went into labor last night. And today as I'm driving to come to the office to do this podcast, I literally have a car in front of me and the license plate says Grammy. And I just start smiling because this is my best friend's first godson or grandson, uh, my first uh, real godson, if you will. Um, so it, it was just this magical moment. And I text her right away. And I was like, the angels are talking. My mom, my dad are there. You know, you're going to be a grandma. And which is really hard for me to grasp right now, too, just as a side note, because I have a 12 year old. And so <laughs> we're exactly the same age and she's a grandma and I've got a 12 year old. So I started late. She started early. So there's that. But as I'm driving, I, right after I see that Grammy, right. I mean, literally two minutes later, I get the text. He's here. He's here. Eight pounds. I still get goosebumps. Um, he's here. And as I go to text her and, and tell her, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. I'm coming around the corner and the Grammy license plate had gone and left. They outran me. All of a sudden the Grammy license plate is in front of me again. And to the right of me is a Texas license plate. And my parents both have passed away, grandparents as well. Um, so they talked to me through license plates and we, that got established really early on. And I can tell more about that, but it's really beautiful. And we live in Las Vegas where there are so many personalized license plates out there. It's it's this weird phenomenon here that I think just because our license plates are cheap. And so everybody's like, we're, we're going to do it personal. But I look over, I see that Texas license plate and and I, I text her right back and I said, they were there. They know. They know this baby was born. And so it's this beautiful circle of life that I can celebrate this gorgeous baby coming in to this planet to help us thrive on this planet and also celebrate my parents that they were there. I know they were there. I know they were there with her. Um, it was a, a good labor. It went fast and um, everything is great. The baby's healthy. I just know that they're there. So um so yeah, so that's where a lot of how I stay moving, you know, um, I often say to my husband, I'm like, you know, I could have been a hoarder, um, <laughs> you know, because of so much death at any given time, like sometimes you just, and, and you, you just give up, but there are so many signs out there. If we can assign those signs, if you will. Um, they show up every single, every single day for me, they show up every single day. And each person was a little bit different. Um, you know, my mom was kind of license plates and she also uh, had mail sent to me in her name to my house. And she had never had mail delivered to my house. And it was um, specific mail, like from uh, Catholic charities that said sacred heart, 
Well, I went to Sacred Heart Catholic Charity School as a child, and my grandfather actually built that school. He architected the the Catholic churches. So all of these things, and and I got mail from her for 20 years, like crazy afterwards, you know, after she had passed on. So just little things. And, you know, some people say, well, you know, that's just coincidence or whatever. But what I will tell you is for me, it keeps me going. It keeps me knowing that their energy is still here because I truly believe that our energy never dies. It just changes form. And so they're here with me. Um, and the person that I'm remembering today is Mary Roby, one of the best moms on the planet. You know, she just, she was magical. And she was one of those people that just would cheer for you. She didn't care who you were. She would cheer for you and root for you and make sure that you knew that you were supported and loved. And crazy enough, um, she did it so much that she actually ended up dying of a bleeding heart, literally. Um, so interestingly enough, I, I have learned from that as well, that maybe don't give everything, you know? <laughs> so that's been my process with her. But she, she was a little bit of crazy and a little, and a, and a lot of love and a little bit, um, and smart. So she was a little bit of everything, you know, and unpredictable sometimes, but in really good ways and sometimes crazy ways as a kid, you know, and we came home from, uh, school one day and I, she had said, I said, what are we having for dinner? And she's like, spaghetti. I'm like, I don't want spaghetti. And my dad was like, I don't want spaghetti either. Oh, God, we've had spaghetti all the time. My mom's like, forget you both and just throws the spaghetti. It goes all over the ceiling, all over the floor, everywhere, and just walks out. And I just realized at that moment, I was like, maybe we shouldn't have said that. She was just like that, but she had a lot of energy that she would um, give to a lot of people. And I think just over time, obviously, even from her heart manifesting into that space, uh, of, of bleeding heart that, you know, she just gave a lot. And, um, I'm so, I'm so grateful for her and, um, so sad too, that she left this planet early. You know, she left at 52 years old and, um, I'll be 51. So it's a really weird space right now. I'm like, wait a minute. She was just like one year older and, I'm like, yeah, I got a 12 year old. <laughs> so, um, but you know, I, I, I think that her staying in spirit around me, it's just, it's one of those things that I, I can't deny every single time it happens. You just can't make it up. Like you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> so are there, what what's the are there any telltale signs or did your mum have have any telltale signs with the what uh, eventuated to a bleeding heart and then does that affect how you um, live and take care of yourself today to I guess safeguard yourself given that you're you know, a year away from when she passed away at her age? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know. Again, I think that what led to bleeding heart is she just constantly gave, 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 and never really gave to herself, never took the moments for herself, including being a mother to me. You know, I was her world. Um, the beauty of my mom when, I mean, I grew up in the South in Texas and there were no overweight kids at all. Like 1970s, there weren't fat kids. It just wasn't a thing. And but I was one of them. So I got tortured and bullied and um, the real kind of bullying, not the like, I'm disagreeing with you right now, bullying, like real bullying every single day from the minute I got on the school bus to the minute I got off the school bus. Um, and one day I came in and uh, she knew I was upset and I went straight to my room and she came and she said, what's going on? And I'm like, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. And I had literally gotten to the point where I just really wanted to take my life, like not in a, 
like, oh, I'm suicidal, but like, why bother? This is terrible. This hurts. It's awful. Um, it's never going away. I can't fix this. You know, my mom was beautiful. Every single Monday we'd start a diet, you know, <laughs> like every Monday was the day to start the diet, but until then let's go get some ice cream to feel better. So, um, she, she said to me, she said, I what's going on? And I said, you know, this one ch kid in particular, he just was relentless and calling me every name in the book, you know, Heather, Heather, not light as a feather, you know, all the things, the whales getting on the bus, hold on everybody. Um, and I just told my mom, I couldn't endure it anymore. And my mom, I said, he, he says that I'm stupid and I'm worthless and nobody's ever going to love me. And she just looked at me and she said, you're wrong. And he's wrong. And I said, well, what do you mean? Like, you're just being nice. And she's like, no, he's wrong. And she, I said, she said, let me tell you something. I had cervical cancer when I was, I think she was like 18 or 19. She had cervical cancer and she had part of her cervix removed. So the doctor said she would never be able to have kids. And even if she did by chance get pregnant, the cervix would never hold the baby. So the baby would basically just fall out if you will. And so she said that my my dad and her were going to be truck drivers and cruise the country and all the things. And then she said she started fe feeling ill and found out she was pregnant. And the doctor said, well, of course, this is never going to come to fruition. Like, just be prepared that you're going to, you know, miscarry this baby. Well, nine, nine months later, two weeks late, 10 pounds, four ounces, here I come out onto the planet. So... You know, she looked at me and she said, let me tell you something. She said, we've tried to have babies after you and we can't. You are a miracle. You were here on purpose. And she said, so, so they're wrong. And that one conversation changed my life. The one conversation, because every time, because he didn't stop bullying me, but every time he did, I would be like, okay, he's wrong. He's wrong. He's wrong. Because I trusted my mother. I trusted her. And I'd say, he's wrong, he's wrong, he's wrong. And it, and it essentially saved my life. Um, now, with that all being said, she did not take care of herself physically. She did not take care of herself emotionally um, or mentally for that matter. Um, you know, I was being, I was raised in the 80s, 90s. Things were changing very quickly at that point in time. Uh, my parents were kind of uh, the kind that, we're keeping up with the Joneses, if you will. So like their best friends that had this Corvette, we had to have this Corvette, we had to have this van, they had to have this van, this house, this house. So it was this constant state of trying to be something that you're not necessarily, you, you aren't. And so I think that that led to it too. And just anytime anybody would call her, she would drop everything and literally do whatever they needed to do, go deliver food to them, bring money to them, watch their children, whatever that was. And while it's beautiful as a human being, it shortened her life. And I believe that not to say that she shouldn't have done any of those things, but to also take time for herself to, uh, you know, one of the things I do is meditate for me, like, and our son is, he has special needs. And so he takes a lot of energy from from me and for me too. And I've just really realized like, I need to take that time for myself because if I don't, I too can fall right in that space. And me personally, it's not so much the genetics of it. It's the emotional genetics of it. It's the, the response system that I was conditioned into of when a friend, and I'm going through that right now with with various people of like, when they call me, I drop everything and go help them. And I've really had to learn to take that back. And it's hard because it's the nice thing to do. Right. But at what expense? Heather, you've got a couple of 
uh, lessons that you've learned from your mum that you've you've already mentioned. So I guess around around the health and taking care of yourself, and then the also I really like this one that the he's wrong and and you're wrong um, situation. That that's uh, a good thing to hold on to to it, and obviously got you through that difficult time. Are there any other lessons that you can remember uh, that your mum has has taught you that you still live with today, and even pass on to your your child to your son? Well. My mom was very, uh, she was all about intuition and your gut feeling, that inner guidance, um, all of those kind of things that a lot of people say are woo-woo. But when we really look at the actual science behind it, and there's a really good, uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza talks a lot about this. Um, He brings in um, epigenetics and um, neuroplasticity and all sorts of um, science to support this, you know? Um, And so one of her big things, when my mom fell very ill um, for the last five, six years of her life, um, and she had multiple health issues, diabetes and heart condition, and um, just a multitude of, of problems. And I was doing my best to help her get better. And she came and lived with us, my husband and myself. Uh, We didn't have our son yet, Uh, but she came and lived with us. And I got her on this regimen and we were walking and uh, in the park every day and doing these special supplements because we're going to heal. We're going to heal from this because again, my mom was in her forties when all this was happening. I was like, this is way too young. Like we can fix this. And So one night she said, um, I said, let's go for our walk. And we took our, our two dogs. We had two Cocker Spaniels and my husband said, I'm going to go with you guys tonight. And I said, why you never go with us. And he's like, I don't know. I just feel like going tonight. And my mom's like, I think you should go tonight. And I was like, okay, he can come, whatever. We're just walking. So we start walking the park. internet issue maybe no you muted me sorry though i got booted so continue on it was the um walking cpr the yeah, yeah no worries no worries so, damn that was like um, ripping <laughs> i know right right so Carry on. Uh, so we're walking in the park and she she falls to the ground and Uh, she's gray. And uh, like I said, I've been trained in CPR for 35 years and I didn't do CPR on her. And I literally just smacked her across the face and people are like, what's going on? And I'm like freaking out. And I literally just closed my eyes and I said, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And I heard this voice in my ear say, stick your finger down her throat. And I was like, stick my finger down her throat. What the, uh, All right. So I stick my finger down her throat and all of a sudden she comes back and we throw her in the back of our, our truck because, um, in our Tahoe, um, SUV, because we, they had called the, the ambulances. Nobody was coming. The hospital was literally a mile down the street. So I said, throw her in. And we got her in, took her to the hospital, went in the ambulance and Trent's, they're like, you can't come here. I'm like, she's dead. And they pull her out, get her in. The doctor takes care of her. He comes out and he says, well, I'm curious. And I looked at him and I said, about, and he said, your mom had a cardiac arrest. And he said, what did you do? I said, I stuck my finger down her throat. And he said, why would you do that? And I said, I heard a voice tell me to do it. And he's like, okay, weird. He said, not a lot of people know this, but when you stick your finger or or object down the person's throat, it creates this gag reflux, which actually acts as a defibrillator to the heart. And so it literally defibrillated her heart back into existence. And 
he said, please don't ever do that again. He goes, because her masseter muscles can just literally chomp down and take your fingers off. And I said, listen, if I'm fingerless and I have my mother, then that's okay. I was like, I would do it all over again, but it was nothing that I was trained into doing. I had been trained for 35 years CPR. I've worked with over 30,000 kids. Like this is what I do. And that's what I heard. And I just went with my gut. I went with what I heard. And then when she came out and she, we had another, I think it was like five years together after that. Um, she said, you know, the oddest thing, she said, when I went down, I literally saw my grandmother and she was talking to me saying it was going to be okay. And I was like, hmm, interesting, because I heard her <laughs> tell me what it was going to be okay. So, you know, I say all of that to say that my mom never, never said, nope, that's not real. Nope, that's not true. Nope, you're just making it up. She was like, that's amazing. Because she knew of a greater force, a greater energy that was around us. She knew it from day one. And I'm so grateful for that because there's so many of us that do this to children along the way where a little kid will say, you know, I saw grandpa and grandpa's been dead for 10 years. Crazy enough, it happens. It happened in my own family. A random family member did the same thing. Her son was talking to grandpa Jack and he didn't, he didn't know that grandpa Jack had died. And they were just having the greatest time together. And so it's, for me, it's just the space that I stay in because number one, the other's just too painful. Not having my mom here, not having my mom here for the birth of uh, my godson's son, like for my own son to watch him grow up has been really challenging. And I know she's still here. I know they're all still here. I know it. I can, I, I get those messages every day. The main thing that Mary Roby did is just remind us all that there's so much more to life than what meets the eye. So much more. I love the spaghetti story, Heather, and I've got a couple of or two and four now. So I haven't yet got to that frustration at dinner where I throw everything up in the air. Uh, but are there any other special memories or favorite memories that you have of your mum? You know, she would kill me for saying that story, but I, I say it because it's important. I think when our, our family members leave this planet, we, we tend to just be like, oh, everything was great and everything was amazing. And my mom was a mom. And now that I'm a mom, I get it. Like, I'm tired. <laughs> like, if you ask me one more question, I promise I'm just going to blow. Like, you know, so I get it. Um, but what I will tell you is that my mom believed in what I I do now. And I, what I do is I help people have conversations that change people's lives, just like this conversation. And what I will tell you is my mom taught me how to have really meaningful conversations. She taught me how to connect into people's hearts and see beyond that which they're presenting and see beyond that they're angry, see that something else is going on. And you know, can I support that? Can I not? Do they need to be left alone? To have all of those kind of social skills and have it inbred in me so, so early in life. She was very firm believer in like letting me be, right? Just letting me be. So she would say to me, hey, you know, go make some macaroni and cheese. And I was three years old. I would scoot up the chair and I'd start stirring and her friend, um, Miss Sandy, which is related to my whole godson, um, my godmother, she would say, you can't let her make macaroni and cheese at three years old. What are you thinking? Like, you're supposed to do that for her. My mom's like, ah, she's fine. She, she, she does it all the time. Put extra cheese in. Okay. Cause it's not good enough to just have the craft mac and cheese. We had to have a block of cheese in it too. So, you know, there were all these times where she gave me independence and, and believed in me, even when I didn't necessarily believe in myself, um, later in her 
last bit of life, I opened, uh, I had a preschool for nearly a decade. And then I opened a wellness center where we did Japanese acupuncture and massage and facials and um, therapies, Eastern therapies, all sorts of things. And my mom helped me open that. She gave me some seed money to start that brick and mortar. Um, and she, I had gone into that business as a partner and it didn't work out. And we knew it about a month then, you know, um, when we went to the attorney, he said, you know, the fastest sinking ship, a partnership. And I was like, oh, oh great. That's fantastic. So we failed miserably together. And the day that I went to the attorney, my mom, my mom had been very, very, very ill. And we knew that this was not looking good. Um, and I had been bringing her lunch every day and just checking in on her every day. And I went and took her lunch and I said, I'm going to the attorneys uh, today to dissolve the partnership. I was buying her out of the business that my mom helped me build. And my mom was like, oh, I'm so grateful. And my mom looked at me, God bless her. She looked at me and she goes, um, just so you know, there's $3,000 in the fabric sheet box in the laundry room. And I go, what, why are you telling me this? And she goes, cause I don't want you to throw it away. If something happens to me, that's just a waste of money. And I'm like, nothing's going to happen to you. Stop putting money in fabric sheet boxes and picture frames and books and coats, please stop. And she was laughing and I went to leave and go do the, um, dissolve the partnership and she was outside and she was sweeping with her broom and she looked at me and I looked at her and I remember I had my Jeep, I had a Jeep Wrangler and I backed up and I put it in reverse, you know, the old school stick style. And I said, mom, it's okay. Everything's going to be okay. Like I'm, I'm, this is no big deal. We've already decided. We've already discussed it. It's done. We just have to do the paperwork. She said, I know. And I just looked at her and I said, are you okay? And she said, yeah. She goes, I just want you to know, I really, really love you. And I was like, I love you too, mom. I love you too. I'll be back. I'll be back. Um, because that night she had decided that she couldn't take care of her cat anymore. And so my dad, they were divorced and he was going to take her cat for her. And so I drove, did, went to the attorney as I'm driving back. I said, mom, it's all good. You know, it's done. The business is mine. Everything's great. No problems. And she was really invested in this business. She, it meant something to her. And she was sitting up front and she was on oxygen. And I was like, I, she wanted to be the front desk. And I was like, mom, I love you. And it looks really bad to have somebody on oxygen on the front desk of a wellness center. <laughs> like, <laughs> it looks really bad. And so she's like, okay, okay. And I'm like, I'm, I'm trying, mom. Um, and so... I'm driving back and I go back to the wellness center to close everything up. I'm going to her house afterwards to get the cat and the cat was her world. And I think I know she knew she was leaving that day. I know she knew she was leaving that day. I closed up my wellness center. There was a couple of, of people left over that were doing some alternative treatment to get um, just their immunities back. And I, I was standing in the doorway and a friend of mine was standing next to me. And all of a sudden, this whoosh of air comes up and through me and out me. And I looked at my friend and I said, did you see that? And she goes, I said, did you feel it? And she's like, I, I didn't feel it, but I saw it. And I said, listen, if that was a bad spirit, you guys are all in trouble because it literally just took over my body. So I went home, was getting ready, meet my husband, and we were going to go over there together. And we went over there and she didn't answer the door. And I knew, and he knew. And we went in and my husband said, stay downstairs. And she was upstairs and she had passed away. And I ran up and he said, no, it's not good. And I ran up and started doing CPR on her. And what I realized very interesting was when I did CPR on her, it was like the air went straight through her body. And it was the oddest experience. It was like one of those shells, those conga shells that it just went straight through her body. And I was like, she's gone. She's gone. And they're like on nine, you know, 911 was like, you have to keep going. I'm like, she's gone. And her cat just kept circling her 
and circling her in the corners like I can't get to your mom through this cat and I was like the cat's protecting her um and you know my dad took the cat that night and I just know that she knew that everything was wrapped up as much as it could be and the, the business was taken care of and it, that meant a lot to her the cat was the most important thing meant a lot to her so I think she knew, I know she knew. And the way she looked at me was a look I'll never forget. And I'm really glad that I had that time with her to say, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and 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 no coincidence, she tells me about the $3,000 and lo and behold, I go in there and I'm like, there it is, there it is, $3,000 in cash in a fabric softener box. So um, it, it, there were just so many magical powerful moments um and and they continue to come and i'm just so grateful to have had the experience of being her daughter heather do you have any advice for people it might be a little bit tricky because i feel like you were certainly attuned to um the spirits of what was happening in the world and very tuned to, you know, your, your mom's actions and, you know, even things that she was saying. Um, do you have any advice for people that um, might go through a similar situation to yourself um, pre their, you know, mom or loved one passing away and then also post them passing away, staying connected as, as you have done? Well, that's an interesting question because pre passing away, we, we knew, you know, her heart was shutting down. We knew um, she died in January, January 6th. And um, she was in the hospital until Christmas Eve. And they said, well, I thought they said, well, you can go home. And they said to her, you might as well go home, which are two different things. And so she came home with us on Christmas and she stayed with us for a few days. And then she said, I have to go home. I have to go home. And I was like, mom, you, you, you can't be by yourself. Like, really? She goes, I have to go home. There's no question. I have to. And to let her pick what she wanted to do in that space was the hardest thing because I, I wanted to make sure that she was taken care of and everything. And what I will say is I know she didn't want to die in our house and so to let her be and, you know, not just, I mean, even with my dad, when he passed away, you know, he too was diabetic and had massive problems, lost his leg, ended up going into hospice and he wanted a Snickers bar and they were saying, no, you can't have a Snickers bar. And I was like, he's in hospice. He can have whatever he wants. If he wants a Snickers bar, have 20 of them. I don't care. And that was a really hard thing for people to understand in my circle. They were like, no, we have to fight for him. We have to, I said, he's made his decision. She made her decision. I'm going to honor that and do my very best to love her through this and love him through this as much as possible. And I think I psychologically started saying, in my head, oh, I just wish they would go. I just wish they would go because I was so scared and I was so sad and I was so um, not knowing the future because I'm an only child. My dad was an only child. His grandparents, his parents were only children. My mom had one sister, which is not part of our family. So like this was the end of the line for me with my mom and dad and grandparents. And I didn't know what it would be like to be an orphan on the planet, you know, and I had to literally say to myself, let them be, L honor their wishes, whatever those wishes are, even if I didn't agree with it, my dad got remarried to a woman, she was a horrible human being, horrible, and um, ended up suing me uh, during his hospice stay, I was served while I was sitting next to my dad, um, to get our estate and our money. Um, not that we even had a lot, but she wanted it. And I remember people saying like, you know, you need to, you need to fight for them, all of these things. And I just, I know my parents, they, they knew when they were done and to honor that space and to be okay with the fact that I was wishing them to leave because 
I know I wasn't wishing them to leave because I didn't love them or I wanted ill harm to them. It's that I was so scared and so sad and knew what was coming was going to be the hardest trek of my life. And it's sometimes it's easier just to say, rip off the bandaid. And, you know, I had guilt about it. And, and after much therapy realized that that wasn't what was actually happening. Um, and both of them were very ill for a, a tremendous amount of time. So I watched them suffer significantly for years and years and years. And, you know, I think at some point in time, it just becomes exhausting as the person witnessing it. So they knew, and, and I think that they also knew that their health was in such poor condition that me having a child would be really hard to take care of them and my child. And especially the child that we have now that is special needs, there's no way I could have balanced all of it. And it was all in my hands as, as a, an only child. I think that when you're an only child, you got to give yourself some grace too. that give yourself some grace that you're doing your best and to give them the grace to leave when they want to leave and to do what they want to do because it's their life. At the end of the day, they're the ones that are walking home by themselves, not with us. Like, so it's hard to do. Um, my best friend's going through it right now with her mother. And I, I'm like, just got to watch the show and love her through it and know that, know that we'll see each other again. It's really good advice. Really, really good advice. And uh, especially, I, I guess, the added extra little bit that I wasn't expecting um, advice for only children as well, um, because that's a, an added layer of difficulty, I guess, uh, where you're not able to bounce that off. Um, you know, siblings in terms of what uh, is the best to do for, for your parents. Um, I, I also cling to your your dad um, wanting the Snickers bar. That's that's probably, I don't eat a lot of chocolate, but uh, if I was in that situation, that's my uh, chocolate bar of choice. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm, is you it were really? Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, oh, um, that's I, so funny. So if I'm in that situation, Ryan, give me a damn Snickers bar. <laughs> Give me a Snickers bar. I, I mean, at the end of the day, like, you know, a Snickers bar is not going to change this. Like that, that's not going to change this. And even with my mom and saving her life, it gave us five more years and those were beautiful years, but it didn't change the trajectory of what was happening either. And I think that it's, it's, it's powerful to give people autonomy and let them do as they will. And as much as it's hard and it, and we suffer through it, at the end of the day, I'm really glad that my parents left this planet on their terms, not mine, not me begging for them to stay if they didn't want to stay. And I had that talk even with my dad. I said to him one day, he was in ICU for seven months, kind of in and out of coherence. And I looked at him, I said, I want you to know that it's okay for you to go. And he just looked at me and he's like, no. And I said, dad, I said, if you're worried about me being sad and suffering, I'm suffering more watching you every single day sit in this hospital and, and not get better. So if you want to live, then let's get better. And if you want to go, I understand, but we need to do something because seven months in ICU is not changing anything here. And he cried and he said, uh, my, my brother-in-law was in the room with me and he looked at my brother-in-law and he said, will you miss me? And my brother-in-law said, of course. And then he decided he wanted to go into hospice because sometimes when you fought for so long, you just can't fight anymore. And that's okay. And I didn't want him fighting for me. And I didn't want my mom fighting for me. I wanted them to fight for themselves else that they wanted to do something on this planet still that they wanted to go on vacations or trips or watch their grandson grow you know that they wanted that experience and that's not to say that they didn't want that experience I think the fight just became too hard and I believe that I believe that this isn't the beginning or the end this is just a blink of the eye and we have so many more times together 
that's my, my, my perspective. So, and that's what keeps me going because this is just a blink of the eye. I, I did some breath work at a retreat and ended up connecting with all my family members and wrote a book on it. Um, and they said that they said that in the book that this is just a blink of the eye. Like we can come and go. It's just a blink of the eye. And that to me, whether it's right or wrong, it's sustaining me in this moment, in this time, in this body here by myself, without family members, without people that have known me since day one. And, you know, the, 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 my best friend's mom that's in the hospital right now, looking to move on and transition out of her body. She's one of the last people that has known me since day one. Um, and it's a very interesting way to live. And I have so many beautiful stories to share about all the things that Mary Roby and Alan Roby uh, did in our lives. And uh, it's just, it, 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 it makes me get up, you know, because when this kind of stuff happens, you just get knocked down and knocked down and knocked down and you got to get back up. And when I'm not ready to get back up again, then I too will leave. But I got a 12 year old <laughs> like, and he is not interested at all in me leaving this planet at any time uh, soon. So I got a lot of work to do with him um, and a lot of work to do in my life. And I'm glad that I have them by my side. It looks different. It feels different, but they're here. They're here always. Heather, if Mary Roby was in front of you in the physical, last question for the, the official podcast, uh, but if she was in front of you in the physical, understand that she's uh, you're connected to her daily uh, on the spiritual level and, and um, other ways that you connect with her as well that we, we've mentioned with the license plates. But if she was here in the physical in front of you, what would you say to her? Well, that's a good question. What would I say to Mary Roby? You know, I would say I finally understand. I understand everything. I understand why you got a divorce from my dad. I understand why you got upset. I understand why you gave so much. I understand the love that you have for me because I have that for my son. I understand how you put yourself aside and I'm sad for that. And on the same token, I know that this is just a blink of the eye. And I'm so grateful that you are my mother, not were, but are my mother. And that we got to do this life together because every single diet was another chance. Every time she said they're wrong, saved my life. Every time she got back up, when people treated her terribly, it gave me that courage and tenacity to get back up, get back up, get in this life, get in this life. And she lived hard and she lived the most beautiful life. And I can't wait to actually physically see her again. Um, because the one thing that you can't get in the spiritual realm is hugs and kisses and physical touch and all of the things. So that's what I'm actually really looking forward to. So if I had her right in front of me, I would just probably hug her for a really long time. <laughs> that was beautiful. Thank you for sharing, Heather. And thank you for coming on to the podcast today and sharing stories and memories of Mary Roby and um, also your dad as well. But uh, speaking so fondly about Mary Roby, it was lovely, uh, you know, for Ryan and I hearing about her, even though we, we never had the opportunity to meet her. And um, it's really nice hearing stories through through you and your lived experience. Um, so thank you very much for sharing. And uh, we really appreciate you giving up your time. I so appreciate you guys doing this. This was so beautiful. I just think that this, when I saw this podcast, I was like, this is magical. Like their, their lives live on and their wisdom and their knowledge and their love lives on. So I love what you guys are doing. And I so appreciate what you're doing. And thank you for trusting me to be on the show.
Thank you, Heather. Thanks, no, Heather. In all honesty, the, the thanks uh, lies w with you. We thank you for um, you know coming on and, and sharing the stories. We love hearing everyone's stories, and, and you've done it beautifully today. So thank you again for coming on. Well, Ryan, yeah. that was Heather from Las Vegas, Nevada. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I feel like we could have probably done a whole other episode with Heather. <laughs> Easily. She had some awesome stories to share, and, and I... I know it's a really, really, really good episode. They're all good episodes, but I know they're a really good episode <laughs> when you sit there and you don't ask any questions because the guests. Oh guess man, just... it's... no, totally. Because well, the thing is, like you, yeah, you know, we obviously have our pre-arranged questions templated, but Heather like answered all of them like on her own. Like, and, I, I know, but, I was... <laughs> but she wasn't, and she mentioned that sometimes she rambles, but she wasn't even rambling. Like, um, yeah, every story I was just like glued to. So. Um, yeah, we just, it was easy. It's sometimes it's just easy. <laughs> it, it was so easy. Even, even for me who did ask some questions, because you're right as, uh, Heather was talking and, and as she said, rambling, I, I didn't feel that way, no. but, um, it, it was covering off on the potential questions I was going to ask. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah it was just like, well, shit, like we got to do something. <laughs> yeah. What the hell am I going to ask? She's kind like, of host, are we? <laughs> yeah. No, that, that was, oh, that was uh, awesome. That was a fun chat. It was uh, it was it was beautiful to hear uh, how she spoke about her mum. Obviously, had such an amazing relationship with mm -hmm. uh, Mary Roby, and um, really took to heart those lessons that she learned from a young age. You know, I think about her getting bullied, and um, obviously, oh, her mum saved her um, yep. and continued. I, th I think continues to save her too mm -hmm. by um, by staying connected. That was yeah. a really awesome conversation. Wild. So glad we rescheduled a couple of times and, and we're yeah, able to speak to her. I was like, uh, yeah, I'm glad you guys are so happy. I got sick for like two straight weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right, well, you can blame, you can blame, blame Mary. Mary. You can blame yeah, Mary. Her, Mary. Her, her <laughs> people. Just, yeah, we yeah, just said like, it. I'm so grateful. I was just like, well, geez, man, come on. Like, what did they do to me? <laughs> it's hilarious. Uh, uh, it's all good. At least I'm a good game. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy. Uh, I loved having Heather on. That was that was awesome. That was so um, cool. Yeah, we should probably we should get it back at some time. That would be cool. I, I think so. I'm gonna I'm gonna extend that invite. You you have those people that uh, you know are gonna be a lot of fun and have a lot to give. And not not only that, the I think the pieces of advice that she had for people were, were awesome too. And the Patreon chat for those that uh, thank you to our our Patreon members that for your support. Um, if you aren't a Patreon member, jump on. It's uh, six dollars a month US, uh, nine dollars Australian. Um, they're the two main currencies that we deal in. So if you're anywhere else, you convert it yourself. But uh, six dollars a month US to have that uh, access to exclusive chats with our guests, not only just Heather but anyone else that we've had on this year. And just as a sneak uh, preview for those that uh, aren't members yet, we talked about the uh, license plates and how that came about and uh, how it continues to play a role um, in Heather's life and connecting with her loved ones. So that that was that was really cool. So I, I for, for no other reason, jump on and and uh, well, obviously support us, but also have access to stories like that with with Heather. It was really cool. It was awesome. We also have the My Legacy Message service, so don't forget about that, mylegacymessage.com.au, where you can uh, service where you can record video messages for your loved ones and, and pass them on uh, to them after you've passed away. So, um, you know, again, Heather mentioned having that conversation beforehand around how you're going to communicate. Well, this is another option to have a hard copy in, in, in video. <laughs> um, remember to follow us uh, on, on our socials, um, Instagram, TikTok, uh, Facebook, and What's the other one? YouTube. My and, um, oh, yeah. YouTube. No, we cut that one, remember? Yes. And uh, a reminder as well, we'd appreciate your support in any way possible. Obviously, the, the Patreon would be fantastic. But also, if you could jump on and give the podcast a rating and review, that will help us show up on, on more people's radars. And um, as Heather said, give people an opportunity to uh, listen to others sharing stories of their loved ones but also if, if you're out there and you'd love to share a story of, of your loved one um in, in the vein that it may help someone else that's going through a difficult time um then please jump on and uh, get in contact with us uh remembering them podcast at gmail.com i think that's covered everything ryan i rambled myself there for a bit <laughs> no it's housekeeping man you killed it well done 
Thank you. I should just pre-record that, but no, it's better if we we talk through it. <laughs> right, I better let That's you get funny. off. You have to return some sleep equipment. I do. Yeah, good times. And have I guess a... you get to go to work. I do. Thank you for joining me. Thank all you right. to Heather. Thank you for our listeners. We appreciate you all. Looking forward to the next fantastic conversation. See you, mate. Well done. The Remembering Them podcast is created for entertainment purposes. Mark and Ryan are not licensed mental health professionals. If you would like to discuss your mental well-being, several free resources are available in Australia. Information about these services is available in the podcast notes. Please take the time to contact a loved one today and tell them how much you appreciate and love them.